Web 2.0. Innovation. Trend. Collaboration. Software. Metadata. Got the world turning as fast as it can? Hear how technology can help, legally speaking, with two of the top legal technology experts, authors, and lawyers, Dennis Kennedy and Tom Mile. Welcome to the Kennedy Mile Report here on the Legal Talk Network. And welcome to episode 286 of the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Dennis Kennedy in Ann Arbor. And I'm Tom Mile in Dallas. Before we get started, we'd like to thank our sponsors. First of all, we'd like to thank NOTA, powered by M&T Bank. NOTA is banking built for lawyers and provides smart, no-cost IOLTA account management. Visit trustnota.com slash legal to learn more. That's N-O-T-A, NOTA. Terms and conditions may apply. Next, we'd like to thank Colonial Surety Company Bonds and Insurance for bringing you this podcast. Whatever court bond you need, get a quote and purchase online at colonialsurety.com forward slash podcast. And we'd like to thank ServeNow, a nationwide network of trusted, pre-screened process servers. Work with the most professional process servers who have experience with high-volume serves, embrace technology, and understand the litigation process. Visit servenow.com to learn more. And with so many new podcasts announcing their very first podcast these days, we occasionally like to mention that at 15 years and counting, this is the longest continuously running legal tech podcast out there. In our last episode, we looked at the many new options for alternative legal careers and reflected on our own career paths. If you aren't sure what you want or if you even still want to to be a, a traditional lawyer, there are plenty of ideas for you in that show. In this episode, we wanted to discuss a conversation started by our friend Kevin O'Keefe about law review articles versus blogs and explore the current state of legal publishing options. There are definitely more than two. Tom, What's all on our agenda for this episode? Well, Dennis, in this edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, we will indeed be talking about the current state of legal publishing opportunities in the broadest sense of the term. In our second segment, we're going to do another round of our new hot or not segment. And as usual, we'll finish up with our parting shots, that one tip, website, or observation that you can start to use the second that this podcast is over. But first up, uh, the current state of legal lawyer publishing, not sure how we want to call it, how we want to frame that. Our friend Kevin O'Keefe raised the question recently about whether blogs or law journals are the best place to publish legal commentary. Um, As we will get into more in just a minute, I'm not sure that's the right question to be asking, but we still thought that it would give us an opportunity to open up on the topic and discuss what we think might be, you know, kind of an update on what might be the best ways lawyers can publish content today. Dennis, when it comes back to that original question, are you in the blog camp or are you in the law journal camp? Well, I think everybody probably knows my answer on that one, but but I agree with you, Tom. The question is is not really that simple, and I think that to me, when you look at, at law journals or law reviews and any kind of print publication, you kind of uh, it comes down to what are you trying to accomplish and and. Uh, who do you want to, to read what you've written and and do you want to ensure that anybody reads what you've written or what your whether there's another purpose that's that's more important than than readership so if you gave me the two choices you know for however many years 17 18 years my answer would have been blog um, and and still is uh, but I, I agree with you Tom I don't think it's uh, the question is quite so simple so I want to get this out of the way to start with, because I don't think this is really the issue that we want to be talking about on this episode. But Kevin wrote a blog post. We'll put a link to the blog post in there. In it, he quotes a New York Times article that I think makes a good argument that law reviews are broken, that they that the model that what they're doing there, you know, they, they quote a bunch of judges saying we never look at law reviews and we never cite them as authority for anything. So what's the point of having them? And I think that they, they, they complain that the same reason why we don't want the New England Journal of Medicine edited by medical students, law reviews, the argument goes, should not be edited by law students. It's a it's a it, it's the similar thing. But 
I think that's a very different point from saying that blogs are a better pay- place to publish legal commentary because law review is not just legal commentary. Law, law review is often legal scholarship, like the New England Journal of Medicine. It's new thinking on legal issues. It's not just law students submitting things. It's professors. It's lawyers submitting things. But it is one of the places where legal scholarship has an opportunity to to be published. And if not law review or a law journal, where do you publish legal scholarship? Medical research isn't published on Dr. Jim's blog. I mean, that's not that's not how that works. I don't disagree that law review is broken and and we can have a whole discussion about that some other time, but I don't think that's really the point here. I don't I think you you have to fix law reviews with blind screening, with peer review, with experienced attorney editors. If I'm blogging something that is legal scholarship, what controls do I have that what I'm saying is accurate? I mean, anybody can, we've talked about this before, anybody and their dog can publish a blog on anything they want to with no guarantee as to accuracy. So that's my kind of my rant saying, all right, I really don't think that blogs are the right place for what previously is in law review. I I really just don't think that that's correct. But let's get maybe back to our point, which is our blogs proper for anything these days. And I think that, you know, you kind of raise a point. Is anybody really reading anything to begin with? Are they reading blogs? So I, I think there's, uh, yeah, ask me on any given day whether I think people are actually reading anything this blog versus, you know, tweeting a link to it or, you know, uh, pointing people to something or grabbing something out of the headline. Uh, but I think that's the way we are in sort of every every kind of publication these days. And that's that's something to think to really think about. Uh, but I want to go take one step back to say, like, I'm not sure that when we think of publication and publishing that and this is my original objection to, uh, to this question was I think there's so many more ways to publish these days. And I think that publishing actually means something quite different than it used to. And so you make some good points about the purpose of law reviews and law journals. And I would say that as long as publication in, in law law journals is a requirement for, for getting tenure, then I think that you publish in those in those journals, you know, if you if you want to get tenure, and that is the purpose of or the primary purpose of that. But I think that publishing is just so much broader, and you have to kind of factor in uh, how you want to use each of the different uh, media that's out there. And I think that's what we'll dive into a bit, but. With the, the law review side of thing, I come back to what I, what I do with any print publication is it takes so long from the time you write something to it's actually published. And then on print these days in the era of COVID, I don't know that you can count on any readership at all. I mean, actual readership. Because if something comes to you in the mail, I think it's pretty unusual that people are actually reading magazines that are in print or other things like that. And there is this big delay. So every time I write something for print, uh, which is very rare these days, my concern is that what I what I wrote that's kind of original and you know, covering something current, by the time, you know, months later, it actually appears in print, somebody else has already written about it, or it's out of date, or, or whatever. Uh, um, And, and that's, that's why I start to think like, well, there are these different modes of publications. And we'll talk a bit about timeliness, but that sort of, from the time that you actually finish something to the time point people can read it, that is a big factor for me. Well, but so let's be fair. I mean, most law journals are online these days. They're not all print publications. So they have the ability or the capacity to be published immediately. Um, whatever happens to the paper thing, I, I, to the paper version of it. I mean, my thinking on this is 
Whatever gets published in a law review or a law journal is something that people are going to want to read for reference. I am a lawyer and I am getting ready to talk about, um, I am I'm defending a key TAM case and I want to see the latest thinking about what's what they're t- talking about. There might be a law review article that covers a new theory on key TAM. And here's the problem with having it on a blog versus having it in a law journal. And, 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 I, and I recognize that we may not have what I'm about to describe fully, but this would be my best of all possible worlds. I'd want to be able to go out there and search a centralized area where I could search for law review articles. You know, if I'm doing that on Lexis or Westlaw, I want to be able to search for law review. But if, say, you know, Jim, the key Tam lawyer, wrote a blog post that has all the stuff about it. What, how am I going to find that? Is it going to be Google? Do I just go out on Google and pray that Jim, the key Tam lawyer, has good search engine optimization and that I'm able to find his blog post? I'd rather go to a place where I know here is where the corpus of information is that I need to find and search that rather than search something else. So that's the benefit to me of having it in a, in a law journal. I would prefer it to be electronic. I totally agree. It's the same argument we've had this whole time about print publications. Takes forever to get books published. Takes forever to get magazines published. Having it online is better. That may be one way to fix these things, but I still think having them in a, in a centralized place is better than have them decentralized on everybody's blog. Yeah, so you mentioned the term centralization. So I, I want to kind of take you back to one of your favorite topics, Tom, which is the hub and spoke model of how um, individuals publish. And um, maybe it's time to revisit that and to say maybe we look at is a blog still the hub with spokes, you know, the spokes around it? Would we say if I write an article in, in a law review, then that's a some kind of hub, and then I repurpose that article in different ways um, with spokes around it. But how do you, you know, going back to our our kind of age-old topic of hub and spoke, how, how do you look at that these days? So I'll talk about how I looked at hub and spoke, and then I'm actually going to talk about what I think is the hot new hub and spoke trend, or maybe the hot new trend of a, of a kind of the hub and spoke model that lawyers aren't doing yet, but should lawyers be doing it? Um, so the, the, the traditional model that we've talked about m- many times on this podcast is that your hub is your blog. The blog is your home base. It's the place where you publish all of your content. It's the place where, again, there are multiple benefits to doing that. You own it. You publish it. It's accessible. You don't worry about it going away or being deleted by another website. You've got it all the time, and, and it's your content. But again, just like just like we talked about with with law review article, if you publish something on your blog and and do people really know that it's out there, which is why it's important to have a number of spokes that help you publicize to bring people back to your blog, to bring you back to your content. And so that spoke might be Twitter, it might be Facebook, it might be LinkedIn. It's any place that you have you are able to go out and say, hey, look. I wrote something on Ketam Law or Family Law or whatever. I wrote something here. Go back and take a look at it. And so it's the many different places where you can let people know what you're doing. You can talk about all those things that you talk about, but it's also just a place to make announcements and say, hey, look, come back to the blog because ultimately what you want is you want your visitors visiting your hub and becoming subscribers of your hub and longtime members of your hub without having to just get what you what, what you say in little bits and pieces out on various social media. I'm going to pause for a minute and say, Dennis, do you want to add to that? And then I, I have a theory for what is a hotter version of that today. No, I definitely want to hear the hotter version. Okay, so here's what I think is what I'm seeing more people doing, because I'm going to make the argument that newsletters are the new blogs. Um, that I'm going to say that so many people are moving now to newsletters, and if we use something like Substack as an example, Substack in form doesn't look any different from a blog for the most part. If I go if you go to my Substack page, which is my newsletter that I did and I admit I haven't done it in a while, but if you go to that page, it is in reverse chronological order and you can click on each one and you read what I had in that newsletter. And that is no different from reading a blog post. It is like a listing of blog posts that you can read right there. 
people are beginning to publish their content on a newsletter site like Substack. We're going to start to see that happen more in more different places as we're recording today. Twitter is starting to make some moves in that direction. Facebook wants to be all about that sort of thing. So we're seeing lots of, of areas for newsletters and other of those kinds of contact. But what I'm seeing people do is saying, subscribe to me, subscribe to my newsletter, and, and so this is where it's, it's not free, but they're saying subscribe to my newsletter. And in addition, you get a link to my Discord channel. And so I've set up a Discord page where every week I have a conversation. Come join a conversation and talk to me. You know, if we're talking about audio is the new social um, that Clubhouse and all these other sites are interesting, you know, one of, one of my very favorite journalists on social media and, and, and the digital culture, um, he has a newsletter, he has a Discord channel, and every week he has, he had Mark Zuckerberg on two weeks ago. Um, he brings people in, he talks to them on his Discord channel, and anybody can join, if you're a member, can join in and listen and participate to that. So now it's interactive. Now it's not just you getting the information from Twitter and learning about the people that you're writing about, it's where people can can interact with you. And this is where I see where it's going is saying, I have one place where I'm publishing my content that could be a newsletter, um, but I'm also offering another place where people can interact with me. And that tends to be something like voice. That could be Clubhouse. It could be, it could be Discord. Um, I'm very intrigued by this because I'm seeing now all the journalists who started their own newsletters, they all have their own Discord channels and they're getting great people on to listen to it. I'm, I'm, I'm almost wanting to subscribe to a bunch of them just so I can go and listen to what's going on um, on these pages. But I am very intrigued by this model and I'm interested to see how well it survives. Yeah, and I think we're going to circle back to this, but I think the, there is the there's no one hub that works best for everybody. And I think people are kind of revisiting that. And that's why I invite people to do as they, you know, as they listen to some of the discussion here, I have this notion called uh, hashtag blog first, uh, where I feel that if I'm doing uh, what I would traditionally done as an article, I would put it on my, on my blog first um, and push it out to that audience and then what I would call the spokes around that. So I publicize the social media and do other things like that. And then my idea is if somebody wants to actually publish it in a print or, you know, online publication, then they can reach out to me and we'll, we'll figure out a deal uh, to, to how they can do that. And that gives me control. And you can go back to, uh, you know, my blog post actually about blog first, but a lot of it had to deal with, I had all this content and what I thought were, you know, publications that were going to be around for a long time and do a good job. And all the links were broken. Uh, and, you know, that was unacceptable to me. And I'm like, well, I just need to, to know that there is a version of my articles in one place. And for me, the blog is OK. But but I think that I look at other places where I would say maybe the hub is something else. And maybe it's where I figure out that I have the most audience or I, you know, the most important of my audience. And that's where I make sure that I do the focus and then kind of spiral out there today. So I guess, Tom, when, when we publish these day, today and think about it, how do we make the calculation these days on, you know, what medium we're going to use or what combination of, of media we want to use? Well, I think there's a bunch of different factors that go into that. I mean, I think that... The first thing is going to be how comfortable you are with the medium. It's, you know, if I'm using the example that I have just used now, um, do you like working in the blog medium? Is it, is, are you comfortable making blog posts? Um, is it easier for you to write a newsletter and, in Word and upload it into a newsletter uh, thing? So you're going to have to, it's going to depend on how comfortable you are with what you're working in, because I would say, it's good to have a stretch on technology, but don't kill yourself if it's going to prevent you from contributing. I think that the other factors are going to be who do you want to reach out to and do any of these different platforms 
have better odds of getting to the audiences that you want to reach. And so I think you're going to have to think about that as well to figure out who, which, which what is, what is the, 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 the best place for you and your content to be. Um, those are kind of the two major things that I think about. Let me think some more about that. But Dennis, what are you thinking as, in terms of the medium? Yeah, I, I always think of like, what's the target audience? And, and then what's the most effective medium to reach that? And give that a lot of thought. And then sometimes you say, there may not be one medium, so I may have to do this in a number of ways. I really focus on timeliness. And, you know, Tom and I, we sometimes joke about uh, people who post things where they say exclusive in all all caps, you know, to, and if you're writing something and it's not going to be uh, published for a couple of months, you can't, you can't kind of say exclusive whereas if you're doing a blog post or a tweet or something you can do that so for example i could say right now i can say exclusive dennis has no idea what key tam means you know and it it has you know it has that uh, that immediacy and then then i think it does come down to you know like what is your goal like what what do i want to accomplish with this which is partially audience but kind of what what do i hope to accomplish like i say if your if your goal is tenure then then you're going to do a law review if you're saying like i want to influence people then you would say hmm, i might blog it I might turn it into a video. I might do a uh, an op-ed in a, a newspaper or some other, you know, thing where I get an an audience. I might cut a video. I might uh, do a podcast. I might try to get interviewed about my article on somebody else's podcast. And so you look at that, and then then I also say that you need to figure out like where are the paywalls and what other barriers are there to to people reading it because if somebody has to subscribe to a site or pay something your readership is going to drop because most people won't go through the hoops the hoops on that i will disagree to an extent with that because there are i think that there are some paywalls that people will not pay for but there are um you know i'll just use substack as an example i think substack makes it so simple to subscribe to a newsletter that it's very easy and and um what's what's nice about substack is if you get a link let's say to an art to a newsletter or an article on substack that you want to read um it'll actually let you go and read that article it's not going to prevent you and say oh it's behind a paywall i think in most cases i could be wrong about that but usually you can uh, with substack it gives you the ability to say show me the content before i decide whether to subscribe which is personally how i prefer to handle that um but i really think that if i only paid you know two or three dollars a month um for content that i really really liked maybe more money per month to do that i'm turning around a little bit on this on the free versus subscription uh, slowly but surely but in, in general i i agree i would prefer not to because i think that there are so many good content providers out there you could wind up spending quite a bit of money if you decide if everybody else decided to to charge a subscription fee all at once yeah i probably wouldn't pay anything for uh uh key tam content myself but that's all right key tam means whistleblower <laughs> lawsuit and 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 it's and it's relevant right now because i'm dealing i'm working with a, a, i'm working <laughs> in my non-legal job with a client who has had a key tam case going on for the last 16 years and so i'm fascinated with the idea of whistleblower lawsuits um and uh and and then just the term key tam is a fascinating term for me so yeah and so uh, I want to go back to this, what I call the reality of readership. So as you kind of track your audience and readership in different channels, um, I think that in the last year, it's it's really tough to figure out like who's actually reading what you're doing versus, like I say, linking to it in it or saying add a boy about it or, you know, whatever. And so when you want stuff to be read, uh, you know, as we have short attention spans and all of that, it's, you kind of need to think through that. In fact, in, on my uh, this week's uh, weekly poll on my Mighty Network site, 
I've, I'm asking like how many email newsletters that you subscribe to do you, you actually read in each week? And I'm expecting to see the other people are like me, and it's going to be an extraordinary low number and a very low percentage. So you're trying to say, if I, if I put things out, then I either need to grab people's attention, you know, by saying in all caps, exclusive or something to, to draw their attention, which you can only do so much of, or I need to kind of repurpose and move in front of people in different ways. And so I think now more than ever, promoting your own, your own content is essential. I think this notion of repurposing to say, can I take what I've done? And there might be a long version, there might be a short version, there might be a blog post, there might be a LinkedIn article, there might be a LinkedIn post, there might be a tweet, there might be a video, there might be audio, I might get interviewed for a podcast, I can do a bunch of things, but I probably need to do all of that. And then for me, I, I just keep looking more and more of saying, I want to put my hub maybe into into the Mighty Networks community I've created, the Kennedy Idea Propulsion Laboratory community, um, and say that might be the hub, but I'm not sure I can make that move yet. And so I still sort of feel the blog is the hub, but I think it's going to, going to change. And I'm not totally convinced that the, the email newsletter, as you say, is the new hub for everyone. I think you're... There's there's a calculation you have to make, and it you know as you as you said there's a lot of factors there, but I think comfort with the medium, where your audience is, and what your goals are are going to help you decide where the the your hub is, and then you're going to radiate out into other channels that also push people back to the main hub. I only want to come back and say very quickly that I need to go and answer your survey on your mighty network so that I can say that. I read every single newsletter that I receive because the deal should be you should only subscribe to newsletters that you are excited and interested to read. And if you find you're not reading it, either because of time or whatever reason you're not reading it, unsubscribe to that newsletter. Just let it go. Just I read every newsletter that I get, even though sometimes it takes me a while. Sometimes I skim them just to see what's in them. I read them all. Anyway, that said, I think it's time to wrap up this topic. I feel like we've been talking about blogs for so long, and I think that blogs still have value. But I really think that with you know things like Mighty Networks and communities coming up and, and the newsletter coming back into prominence and tools like with audio uh, where you can have conversations, I think that it is a great time to reevaluate what your content strategy needs to be and how you want to publish yourself to the audience that you want to reach. And I, I just think it's an exciting time to start thinking about that um, because we're, we, there are so many different options out there and so many different variables um, to be successful. Right. And it could be that, uh, you know, your YouTube channel and video is going to be a much better central place for you, that hub, than a blog would ever, ever be. And it's just comfort with, you know, blogs work for people who are writers. Um, and I think people sometimes forget that. Uh, but I, yeah, I just think there's so many opportunities now and so many, many ways to get them to, to interact with each other and to really reach the audiences that you want. I mean, it's difficult because of COVID and people's attention spans, but there are more options than ever. All right. Before we move on to our next segment, let's take a quick break for a message from our sponsors. Wish you could get a quote and purchase an appeal, trustee, estate, or any other court or fiduciary bond quickly online? Colonial Surety Company has every bond you need and is a direct insurer that's U.S. Treasury listed, licensed in all 50 states and territories, and rated A excellent by AM Best, so you can be confident it's a trusted resource. Get started at colonialsurety.com forward slash podcast. You went to law school to be a lawyer, not an accountant. Take advantage of NOTA, a no-cost IOLTA management tool that helps solo and small law firms track client funds down to the penny. Enjoy peace of mind with one-click reconciliation, automated transaction alerts, and real-time bank data. Visit trustnota.com legal to learn more. Terms and conditions may apply. 
Looking for a process server you can trust? ServeNow.com is a nationwide network of local, pre-screened process servers. ServeNow works with the most professional process servers in the industry, connecting your firm with process servers who embrace technology, have experience with high volume serves, and understand the litigation process and rules of properly effectuating service. Find a pre-screened process server today. Visit www.servenow.com. And now let's get back to the Kennedy Mile Report. I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy. It's time for a new segment we call Hot or Not. We pick something people are talking about and argue whether we think it is hot or not. We might agree, but odds are that we won't. And we want your feedback on the segment. Let's get started. Tom, forcing lawyers and staff back into the office this summer. Okay, now you just added this summer to the script, and it wasn't there before. So that that changes my answer somewhat. You used the loaded word forcing. So I'm tempted to say not. But, you know, to be honest, I've got to tell you, I'm looking out there, and I'm not seeing a ton of evidence of firms forcing anyone back into the office, and certainly not this summer, Um, at least big firms. Now, I am sure that there are businesses that are already back in the office. I am sure that there are other firms where we're not seeing it widely reported on smaller firms. So of course, it's possible that some are already back in the office. There is a recent law.com article that lists 12 big law firms. Some are not re- still not requiring anybody to return in 2021. They're w- letting people come back in 2022. Some are adopting hybrid workplace working models. Some are requiring employees to be vaccinated before they come back. Most of the law firms that I see these days are looking now at Labor Day. Labor Day seems to be a magic day. And, and frankly, for a lot of my clients, too, a lot of companies are looking at Labor Day as the time when people are going to start to come back. But I have to say, I don't see a lot of forcing going on. I know that one one firm quoted, everyone will be expected to work for at least some of the week in the office. And so if you could call that forcing, maybe it's forcing. I'm sure there's a lot of law firms out there that aren't big enough that are doing this to cover. But I don't know, the bigger firms seem to be thoughtful about going back. And you may have some examples differently. But I would really like for law firms, to the extent that they're not doing this, to start looking at companies outside of the law for inspiration. And there was a recent article that I'm going to put in the show notes from Google. Now, Google is should not be the example for everyone. They have bajillions of dollars to do whatever they want to do. So, But I, I, what I love is they can afford a ton of experiments. And they're doing a ton of experiments on how to come back to work. But what they're doing is they're looking at three trends that really apply to all companies. Doesn't matter if they're, you're a rich company, a poor company, a big company, a small company, a law firm. There are three trends that I think trends that I think apply to all companies. One is work can happen anywhere and not just in the office. This is the pandemic proved that that was possible, that we could actually work other places beside the office. Second trend, what employees need from the workplace is now changing constantly. And we as lawyers have not been good about recognizing that. I think that is another trend. And then finally, workplaces need to be more than desks, meeting rooms, and amenities. They have to be more than just a place where um, where meetings and those types of things take place. They are more than that. I included the article on Google's plan for the future of work. It has some really cool ideas that law firms will never, ever adopt. But I like the fact that people are thinking about this. We've heard this overused phrase that legal technology has come 10 years in the past year. I think that legitimately the same might be said about workspace. When we're done with this, I think that we're finding new ways to to, to make it happen. I, I will have to say, I don't see the forcing Back into the office this summer, I see that uh, it will become harder to avoid going into the office later in the year, but uh, forcing is not what I would use right now. Well, Tom, in fairness, and this is a reflection on the earlier segment, I I only read the headlines, but uh, a couple (laughs) reports this week of law firms saying that in July, and big law firms saying everybody has to be back in the office. And so I think it actually is in the warming up category because once, you know, law firms act together, especially the big law firms. So once a couple do it, a lot of them are going to do it. And so that it puzzles me, right, because we've learned a lot over the last year or so. And one of the things we've learned is that 
the people can work unsupervised and they can work at home and they have built a lot of hours, done a lot of work over this year in exceptionally difficult circumstances uh, without, you know, being in the office. And that to say, if I if I worked at a firm and they said, you have to be in the office on July 1st because despite all that you've done in the last year, we don't really trust you enough that you can still do this on your own. We need to have you back in the office. And by the way, we're going to have a dress code. We're going to have all, all this. And I'm going to go after a year. Uh, and Tom, you know me well, so you know what my reaction is going to be like, hey, I'm not in kindergarten anymore, you know. And if you think I'm going to be back in the office and I come in there and every single partner and managing partner is not there, then the first day that it happens, I'm working from home from from then on, you know, and, you know, fine, fire me. Because I think what happens is that great quote I've been reading lately called the best talent always has options. And I think at this point, we're already seeing things where people are trying to mandate people back in the office and people are saying, no, I want to work from home. And I want to do the way that I work best. And I don't want to do commutes. And I don't want to go through, you know, uh, trying to figure out how to go up in an elevator two people at a time and all of this. Um, I'm, I, you know, I'm way more productive at home. And so I think the, some of the best, the most creative talent will just look look to go somewhere else. So I think it's uh, the lukewarm and warming up, uh, but uh, it's actually very troubling to me that in in a profession where one of the things you like is that you can work unsupervised and you have a lot of independence in your work and a lot of creativity, that you're going back to this really kind of micromanaged way of forcing people to, to go back to the old normal. So concerning trend for me, but I think it, it we could see a lot more of it. So now it's time for our parting shots at one tip website or observation. You can use the second this podcast ends. Tom, take it away. Okay, it only took an entire year of the pandemic for me to um, finally outfit my office the way that I wanted to. I finally got the standing desk I ordered a while back. I got it set up two weeks ago. I love, love, love it. And I have, as my parting shot, two accessories that I purchased for it that are both incredibly useful to me, and I, and I love them both. The first one is called the Rode, R-O-D-E, PSA-1 Swivel Mount Studio Microphone Boom Arm. Dennis and I record the podcast. Occasionally, I will want to use a, a real a, a professional microphone when I have calls or video meetings or things like that, um, but I hate having the microphone on a stand on the desk. It gets in the way, and I, and I have to disconnect it and put it away every time that I use it. I really hate that. I've, I've attached a boom arm to the side of the desk by a, a clamp, and I just push it out of the way when I'm done with this podcast, and then I bring it back whenever. It is so convenient and easy. It works so well. I love it to death. It's about, I think the one I got is about $100, $110, $120 boom mic. Um, there are a number of them out there. This one gets a lot of good reviews. The other one, a little bit pricier, but also very worth it, is after years of having plastic desk mat underneath that, um, that that crack after time and, and get old. Um, I splurged and I went for a glass chair mask. It's by a company called Vitraza, V-I-T-R-A-Z-Z-A. Um, it's a glass mat. It is so nice. It is solid. I um, don't have to worry about uh, it wearing out or anything. It's just a beautiful mat. A little pricey. This one that I got is a little bit bigger that's more expensive depending on the size. Mine was somewhere in the range of $300, but there are those that are smaller depending on the size. I love them both and can recommend both of them if you're looking for these uh, items for your home office. Dennis. So I'm literally looking at Tom's uh, uh, microphone boom arm, and I can tell you that he totally loves it. Um, I do. It's, it's, I love it. It's very obvious yep. to me. So one of the projects I'm doing is, is something called Exponential Legal, which is an online course um, about productizing legal services, and it's uh, www.exponential.legal. And so I like the course, obviously, because I helped create it. But 
as people kind of look into the notion these days of what can I do to kind of turn what I'm doing uh, as a lawyer into not just this service that I do over and over again, but some kind of product that I can sell or license or generate revenue um, without my personal time involvement. Um, I saw this thing from uh, After Pattern, uh, which is one of the tools that you might use actually to create a uh, productized service. It's called The Ultimate Guide, How to Build Legal Products. And I think it's a great intro and overview to some of the types of products and then also some of the tools that you you might use to create those products. So to me, it's like you read this article and if it interests you, then I would encourage you to to take our course, but uh, but this will give you a good overview. And a lot of times, people say, "I have, I think I might have a product idea, but I don't know exactly how I would do it." This is really good to give you a sense of the the tools and and software out there. So that wraps it up for this edition of the Kennedy Mile Report. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. You can find show notes for this episode on the Legal Talk Network's page for the show. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes or on the Legal Talk Network site, where you can find archives of all of our previous episodes along with transcripts. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can always reach out to us on LinkedIn or send us a voicemail. We'd love to answer your question in a B segment. That number is 720-441-6820. So until the next podcast, I'm Tom Mile. And I'm Dennis Kennedy, and you've been listening to the Kennedy Mile Report a podcast on legal technology with an internet focus. If you like what you heard today, please rate us in Apple Podcasts, and we'll see you next time for another episode of the Kennedy Mile Report on the Legal Talk Network. Thanks for listening to the Kennedy Mile Report. Check out Dennis and Tom's book, The Lawyer's Guide to Collaboration Tools and Technologies, Smart Ways to Work Together, from ABA Books or Amazon. And join us every other week for another edition of the Kennedy Mile Report, only on the Legal Talk Network.